Terraria is an incredibly interesting game. It sold millions of copies, it's still getting updated to this day, and yet it was completely critically overshadowed by Minecraft, a magical game that came from space and with no known developer. And I think that's a bit of a shame, because I love Terraria to bits. Seriously, you could make a whole video about its really cool boss design, or the great build flexibility it offers you, but nope. What I want to talk about is the really clever way it makes you feel like a master. Mastering a game feels great. It's a step up from the quick rush of smashing a boss's teeth in or advancing to the next tier of progress. The feeling of using your knowledge of the game's systems, plus a little bit of creativity to do something cool, is really hard to come by in any other medium. Mastery takes many forms. It could be knowing the best options to pick in order to counter a metagame, it could be knowing all the hacks, glitches and skips for speedrunning, or it could just be having the knowledge and skills required to get to the end of a game. They all feel awesome to pull off, and they're all evidence of mastery. The key though, is that mastery isn't really about just being good at a game, it's more of a process, a series of discoveries and realisations by which you develop a deep understanding of not just how to beat a game, but how it works, ending with that state of total and complete control we're all familiar with, and can see here. I have no idea how any of this is happening. This is where Terraria comes in. On top of all of its other achievements, Terraria is really good at creating this feeling of mastery right from the outset, and I think we've got a lot to learn from the way it encourages and rewards thinking outside the box over and over again throughout gameplay, rather than just towards the end. This lesson is instilled very early on. The first boss of the game, the Eye of Cthulhu, absolutely annihilates most first time players. It's more manoeuvrable than you, will easily win a straight up damage race, and even transforms halfway through the fight. After a humiliating defeat, players often resolve to explore the world and get better gear before coming back again. And this is exactly the process Terraria wants you to go through. Exploring into the underground and surface level caches will usually give you a bunch of shurikens, throwable weapons that aren't much use against regular enemies, but they can really help to level the playing field between you and the Flying Eye of Cthulhu. Shurikens can put some crucial distance between you and the boss, hit him more than once if it's in the air, don't cost mana, which is in short supply early game, and will also deal with his gross little eye babies in the first phase of the fight. They're pretty much tailor made for fighting the Eye of Cthulhu, turning an otherwise pretty crappy weapon into something really useful. Your victory the second time around feels great, like you've conquered a challenge not through rote memorization of its attacks or just optimizing your gear, but by outthinking it. Similarly, the Eater of Worlds, which is summoned by smashing open these orbs of corruption, is super vulnerable to the Vile Thorn, a magic spell only found by breaking shadow orbs. Each of his body segments counts as a separate enemy, and so you can rack up bonkers damage with the Vile Thorn's area of effect attacks and kill it in a matter of moments. Of course, you can also just build a boss arena, which will trivialise nearly every early game battle, because they put the manoeuvrability advantage in the hands of the player, letting you endlessly kite bosses, or just jump over most of their attacks. All of these solutions almost feel like cheating, but they aren't. The game is actually ever so subtly nudging you in the right direction, allowing you to figure out these cool interactions all by yourself and feel like you're a total genius for working it out, even though almost everyone realises you can do stuff like dig a massive hole and use a 4 damage negating item like the horseshoe to skip running through cave systems and make a shortcut to hell. If the game just told you how to beat the Eye of Cthulhu or that elevators were a great idea, you wouldn't get the chance to work these things out for yourself and so wouldn't be able to enjoy the process of mastery. Terraria's core mechanics aren't really anything special, what is praiseworthy is how it embraces and fosters this inventive spirit by letting you sequence break and abuse the game mechanics to your heart's content. I beat the Queen Bee way earlier than I was supposed to by letting my NPC minions do all the hard work of actually killing her. Instead of not letting me summon it until I was ready, or by punishing me for cheating, I managed to get my hands on a cool sword that summons bees as a reward for my clever thinking. It's perfectly understandable why developers would choose to stop players from going to certain areas, or lock off content until they're ready. Even open world games need to have some sort of difficulty curve and means of progression, and restricting a player is a great way to ensure they don't get overwhelmed. Games with a narrative focus too need to make sure that players experience the story in a way that makes sense. After all, there's not much point starting Bioshock with the shocking reveal that Andrew Ryan doesn't like golf very much, is there? But for games that can afford to let players off the leash, giving them an opportunity to skip ahead and try out things they might not be ready for is a great way to create some organic mastery so long as there's at least some guidance there in case they need it. This is the takeaway from Terraria I think is the most important. The feeling of mastering a game is a defining experience of the medium, but most people can't spare the hundreds of hours it takes to even begin mastering games as complex as say Dwarf Fortress without help. It's the responsibility of the designer to make understanding and mastering their game as easy as possible without spoiling the fun 
of figuring out how all the pieces fit together. For example, in Snakey Bus, which is, is a game that's kind of like Snake, except with a bus, it's, you know, it's really cerebral, you've got to think about that one. Most of the early levels are pretty much flat, but the museum level has a massive degree of verticality, and is cleverly designed to let players experiment with the intricacies of the wacky flight mechanics. For example, how only the front carriage is affected by gravity, or how the hitbox for drop-off points stretches pretty far up into the air. This knowledge lets you go back to earlier levels like Paris, and rack up way higher scores as you zoom around the stratosphere and then drive safely to your next stop through tunnels made by your previous route. This is a totally organic bit of player innovation that's also almost certainly intended by the designer, and it not only leads to a few great aha moments, but also a more educated player. It's a win-win scenario that never could have happened if I was told about these tricks to start with. But it's not enough to just give the player a single taste of mastery, you've got to keep giving them opportunities to learn and test their knowledge, uncovering more depth as they do so. Renowned explorers, a really fun light strategy exploration game from a few years back has some great storytelling and world design, but squanders the potential of its combat. Combat is based around manipulating your opponent's emotions or talking them out of fighting, and the theme totally works. Getting to grips with making an opponent angry so my physical attacks do more damage was really fun, until I realised that, that that was about it. Before long, I was resolving every fight across multiple playthroughs in pretty much the same way with nothing new to discover about how it all worked. As much as I loved the rest of the game, I ended up dreading the combat, as I'd figured out all of its mechanical mysteries long before I'd seen all the real ones the game had to offer, souring the experience as a whole. The trick then, is to keep giving the player chances to improve their mastery in small but significant ways, avoiding knowledge dead ends, and if possible, helping players to learn things that could apply in more than one place. Mastery is a completeness of understanding, it's just comprised of many small steps. Heaven's Vault is a puzzle game that sees the archaeologist Mayari and her psychic Six uncovering the secrets of an ancient empire that existed thousands of years in the past, whilst also uncovering a mystery in the present day. But the whole thing is… also in the future, it, it, it's a bit confusing. The game's main mechanic is these translation puzzles. You've got to use your gradually expanding lexicon of words, context, and plain old guesswork to gradually piece together what happened to a variety of abandoned archaeological sites. Heaven's Vault is a daunting game, it's got some pretty in-depth lore, lots of characters, and a big mystery story playing out over thousands of years on multiple planets. Keeping track of it all is hard work, but luckily, you don't really have to. A basic early game puzzle is the inscription on this figurine found in a ruined temple to the ancient space emperor. We could notice that the statue looks like the water goddess from earlier in the game and work it out from there. We might know that this word looks a little bit like the word for holy, so it could mean blessed, we can see that this little word at the end looks like a plant, so it could mean plant, or we could realise that this shrine was found right next to a dried up river gully, letting us work out the inscription from context. Heaven's Vault is pretty tricky, but because it gives you so many different ways to solve hundreds of micro puzzles, you have ample opportunities to master the game in a way that makes sense to you. Even if you don't know the word for star, or have forgotten what year the Empire fell, or if you got the name of the main character wrong about a minute ago. She's actually called Alaya. But that doesn't really matter, and Heaven's Vault knows it. To master a game, what's important is understanding concepts, not just learning every single bit of information. So, to recap, mastery is the process by which we don't just get better at a game, we understand it in a way that's really satisfying to explore. Designers can't force mastery onto a player, it's something they have to find for themselves and gradually build up over the course of many smaller discoveries and little moments of creativity. Terraria, as well as some other less important games, execute on this idea brilliantly, by giving players loads of room to experiment, but subtly pointing them in the direction of some cool mastering milestones. But there's one more thing I'd like to talk about in regards to making players feel like masters, and that's the need for some sort of incentive. If a game is too easy, or offers no reward for learning and experimenting with the mechanics, then 99% of players, they're just not gonna bother. To avoid this, players need to be given a reason to explore the mechanics and master the game. Toki Tori 2 a brilliant metroidvania slash puzzle game, is unique in the fact that you don't gain any mechanical upgrades at all over the course of the game. There's no cute bird-sized varia suit, no missiles to break down rocks, nothing. All the keys to unlocking more of the world exist in the form of mastery, by learning how your stomp and chirp moves can manipulate the wildlife of Toki Tori Island. The game teaches you very early on that birds like to pick stuff up and take it back to their nest, but if you're clever in this waterfall area, you can distract all the birds with frogs and make it down to a cave level you weren't supposed to access until much later on. It's filled with bats, masks, chirpy doors, running water and firefly cages, 
none of which you've been taught about so far, and it is completely overwhelming. And yet, this puzzle is totally solvable if you come back later, armed with the knowledge of how to deal with bats and masks, as well as how to open these doors, allowing you to move on to bigger and better things. This previously insurmountable obstacle gave you a reason to pay attention when its elements were introduced for real, and that level of prior investment means it feels even better to go back and show those bats who's boss. Players need a reason to master things. As fun as the process is, we're not going to do it without a kick in the backside to get us going. And Terraria knows this better than anyone. After defeating what you think is the final boss, the Wall of Flesh, hard mode gets activated. Suddenly, all your movement tricks, all your gear and everything you've learned up until this point gets pretty much totally thrown out the window. And now you've got to learn a whole new set of tricks to deal with the virulent spread of the corruption or crimson, much tougher enemies, whole new biomes, and bosses that have learned some tricks of their own. Right when you thought you had nothing left to learn, Terraria flips the script, giving you, in effect, a whole new world's worth of mastery to attain. Isn't that brilliant? Mastery is a difficult concept to pin down, because it's different for every game and for every player. So instead of just following exactly what the game or someone else tells you to do, you should feel free to experiment with what you've been given, because chances are you'll have way more fun, and you might even discover that that's what you were supposed to do all along. To quote Master of Martial Arts, singing and acting Jackie Chan, I'm not sure if it's good to have freedom or not. Oh no. Oh no, Jackie, don't say that. Hello and thanks for watching. Unlike a certain popular HBO fantasy drama, this show, hopefully, just gets better. And that's thanks to the generous support of my patrons, some of which are on the side of the screen right now, and you for watching. At the end of each episode, I read out the names of my top tier Patreon supporters. If you wanted to kind of continue the Game of Thrones metaphor, they're kind of like people who've read the books. They get some additional special info, some looks at stuff that might happen in the future, and of course, they're the ones who get the most disappointed when it all goes horribly wrong. Anyway, they are... Alex Deloch, Asaran, Alno94, Baxter Heel, Brian Natariani, Calvin Han, Colin Herman, Daniel Metjes, Dirk Jan Karambeld, Feetzalot, Jesse Ryan, Jonathan Christensen, Joshua Binswanger, Leech2, Lucas Slack, Lunar Eagle1996, Mace Window54, Patrick Romberg, Ray's Dad, Samuel Vanderplatz, Strateger in Ultima, Yaren Mirren, and Chow. Thank you all so much for watching and supporting the channel, and I will see you hopefully very soon for another video. Bye!